On this episode of A State of Control, we talk about the impact of mainstream programming languages on the AV control industry. Manufacturers are adopting these languages and moving away from some of the proprietary languages. What impact does that have on AV programmers? What do they need to know? And where are things headed in the future? All that and more on A State of Control. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. A state of control. A state of control. A state of control, episode 43. Kung Pao Programming. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Kramer, AV Beyond the Box, and by SDVOE, the platform for networked AV. Welcome to A State of Control, an AV Nation podcast that highlights the control, programming, and automation aspects of the audiovisual industry. My name is Steve Greenblatt. I'm your host today. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we have a show that I think is going to be of particular interest to programmers. We're going to be talking about the impact of mainstream programming languages in the audiovisual space, and I think that it should stir up some interesting conversation. So with me to fuel that conversation is my partner in crime, everybody's favorite uncle, Uncle Richie Fergoza. Thank you for being with us today. Rich, how are you? I'm good, Steve. Uh, Mellow West Coast greetings, and uh, my silent partner, Alexa, behind me also says hello. Uh, so she's not going to be part of the conversation today. Oh, <laughs> except for the one in the other room just decided to ch- ch- chirp in. You never know. <laughs> Next is a familiar face coming to us from Germany. His name is Patrick Murray from Control House. How are you today, Patrick? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Thanks for joining us. And yeah. last but not least is... Derek Jonkis from Extron. He's been on some other shows, but this is his first pass at State of Control. He says he's a longtime listener and uh, glad to have him on board. How are you today, Derek? Ah, thank you for allowing me to be part of the club today. This is pretty cool. Thanks for joining us. So let's start the conversation here. For quite some time, as many of us know, the audiovisual industry from the control aspect has been fueled from manufacturer-specific proprietary programming languages. It's really been the way things have been done for a long time. Um, And programmers have had to not only learn what it takes to interface with devices and define functionality, but they had to go and learn specific tools and platforms and languages that were of use for particular products in, in the control space. Well, as things have progressed and, and what we're seeing right now is, is the influence of mainstream programming languages. And when we talk about those, we're talking about C Sharp, we're talking about Python, we're talking about HTML5, we're talking about um, CSS and, and others. Um, uh, 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 Rich, I'll start with you on this. You know, for, for, for a long time, you know, we made a big investment in these other languages and, and now we're seeing things shift significantly is this something to fear? Is this something to be excited about? What, what, what's your take on it? It's, it's just the natural evolution of our industry. I think that um, when we all first started with the dedicated languages or purpose-driven languages, uh, we have to take into context that, you know, the, the majority of them, there, there was no network when we first started with these. You know, we didn't have to worry about intercommunication of thousands of devices, potentially. Um, it was kind of point to point in the beginning. And so these original purpose driven languages were written for a specific purpose to get from point A to point B. Um, as efficiently as possible and also keep it in context. I mean, I remember, um, you know, when, when we had a whopping 64 K of memory to work with on some of these chips, uh, you know, it had to run lean and mean and, 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 and the, the language had to maximize, um, the chipsets that we had at the time, fast forward, literally 25 years later. Um, 
and we are part of the technology industry. We are no longer the AV industry. We're no longer the control industry. We are part of the greater technology industry. And with that comes with you got to play well with the other kids <laughs> on the playground. And these tools are being used by millions more users and developers out there than what we have in, in our industry. And I think it's great. I mean, it, it's daunting. I mean, again, for, for somebody like me and, and, and for you, we, we invested a lot in that process and we have a lot of the habits from that process. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm much closer to 50 than I am 20 these days. Um, so it, 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 is, it is something that I think for people who started out in the industry, um, there's a little bit of fear and trepidation. I think for people entering the industry, I'm excited because it gives me an opportunity to access a talent pool that I've never had access to before, who is going to be getting trained um, on the university level, uh, e even the self-taught level, um, hackathons, all of these things. That it, 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 There's an opportunity for me to get fresh ideas and, 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 and get fresh approaches from people that I didn't have from before from our industry where we would have to cultivate it. So, um, you know, I think initially everybody's got that, uh Oh, you know, is this going to put me out of business? Um, and then you realize that, you know, somebody who sat there and made a web page two or three times has gotten really good at that side of the development has no understanding of the greater side of the industry. So it, it's, it's going to be a marriage of it. I think as time passes. And so I got over my fear, um, you know, it was a little rough too. Um, but I, I'm seeing more and more the opportunity for me to do less and to collaborate more. So Patrick, following up on what Rich is talking about and, and you two have invested a lot in getting acclimated and knowledgeable and, and building expertise in these platforms, but yet I know that you've also shown the initiative to take the leap into the mainstream side what motivation did you have there and 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 what where 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 do you seeing in in terms of the opportunities to to use these new languages all right so um I, I like the way rich put it uh purpose driven languages i never really thought of it that way but that really does hit the nail on the head and that was kind of my motivation to to learn new programming languages is that um you come up against the limits of what a purpose driven language can do and once you start using modern programming languages to uh, solve certain solutions, then you see, okay, I'm no longer limited by certain things. So it's, it's really just a matter of choosing the right tool for the right job. And the driver is really just people's expectations today are so much higher than they used to be, right? No, nobody knew what we did 20 years ago. What do, you, do you fix TVs? What is that? Now everybody's walking around with a touch panel in their pocket and they mean, and they're saying things like, what do you mean my system can't send me a notification, a push notification on my uh, mobile when something happens? Things like that are just expected. And the purpose-built languages can't always do these things. So, um, so we're kind of, you need to look at other alternatives to, uh, in order to fulfill certain requirements that, uh, that people are just expecting nowadays. Uh, uh, Derek, I'll, I'll jump over to you. Um, Xtron is one of these companies that has adopted a programming language and that is Python. And, and part of the, the platform is also a, a configured approach. What, what's the, uh, the motivation there? And, and, and from your perspective personally, where do you see things headed industry-wise in terms of the value that Python can bring? I think for, for extra on um, the real motivation was to not only help um, people in our industry be able to maybe adopt things that are closer to being like an open, more publicly available language. But I also think, you know, inside of extra on that to develop the products, you need to be able to find the, the right kind of talent and to develop in proprietary languages, which we had, had done in previous iterations, previous generations of our configurable products. Uh, we saw an opportunity to actually be able to extend you know, our knowledge and capabilities that we garnered there, but use Python as sort of the basis of that. And that was a little more than, that's probably more than five years ago now. And uh, now to be able to extend that both in configuration and in programming you know, on a single platform, that's a big win for our customers. Um, because just for all the reasons that have been mentioned, and uh, it may be, you know, maybe as AV programmers, 
forget, you know, there's a lot of knowledge in our industry about how to make things work. And, you know, no amount of uh, open language solves that, solves that wisdom problem. You know, Rich, you mentioned, uh, you know, you're getting closer to 50, as am I, than I am 20. Even, uh, even if I think I'm 20 for two minutes on a Sunday, it's not, uh, it's not for that long anymore. Right. And so what I want to say is that, uh, you know, even when you have a non-proprietary language, um, you still need the wisdom to understand how these systems need to be propagated. You, you know, we sometimes I think, you know, we, the first thing we hear is, okay, there's something that's new. You know, what are the limitations? What are the things I need to learn? But you forget that you get that backpack of wisdom that you can carry with you that really helps you no matter what tool you're using. Because, you know, of course the tools are important, but that wisdom, that wisdom to me is the most important. And that really is on the personal level for me as well. Having an open language is really easy because I have a lot more resources at my disposal um, as someone who wants to learn more or to extend their knowledge, things that uh, both Patrick and Richard have mentioned. And then uh, along with that, um, it, gives, uh, it gives you the opportunity to be able to try out new workflows, try to get done the same work maybe in a different way, maybe try to cover different levels of projects um, instead of just using the same workflow that you've used before. And I'm sure, you know, people run into bumps in the roads with that, but that's where your wisdom helps. That's where your experience helps. And I think we have a lot of that in our industry and sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for it. So I think we touched on two interesting things here where one being the fact that this opens the door to new talent and two, it, it provides with different opportunities to do things in different ways. Um, Patrick, uh, I'll, I'll kind of, jump to you what what does it take to really learn these languages and and you know and, and what Derek Derek mentioned with regard to the knowledge and we've all kind of I think we all agree upon this you, you're not just going to get somebody off the street who's going to be able to walk in and even though they may be an expert in a partic particular programming language it, it doesn't always translate that easily to AV right so um yeah, so, so the first step is to start small. Um, definitely do some of it yourself so that you have an idea of, of what, uh, yeah, what you're talking about and what the workflows are, right? And then um, it, it becomes easier to talk to software developers who don't come from AV because like Derek was saying, that wisdom they don't have. Um, I find that uh, software developers, non-AV software developers are really excited about working with real devices in the real world, but we, I do have to spend a lot of time with them just explaining what it is we're trying to accomplish and, and how we're gonna get there. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about flows, like what is the flow of the system? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? And that's where I think it's important to, of course, have all of your wisdom, have all of the understanding that you have built up all over the years, but also to have some kind of fundamental knowledge of whatever programming language or methodology you're working with. You don't have to be an expert in these things to start working with uh, other developers, but it's really helpful just to have an idea of, of how you can structure things. So I suggest to people who's really just start small, turn a light on and off, and, um, and then take it from there. Uh, Derek, I'll, I'll kind of jump back to you. you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is, is it important to understand why to use a language and is it, and this, is this something that needs to be a discussion that the client should be involved in? Because uh, I mean, and, and I, I use Xtron as an example because I think that they're, they're two very different approaches and it, and, and how, how does that come into play in, in deciding what solution to provide? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, I mean, just for the background, you know, we have been known as a configuration company. There's always been programming behind the scenes. That's how those systems work and operate. Now everything is done with Python. So whether it's the configurations that we, we build in our software, whether it's the drivers we use in those environments, or whether it's our modules or just the, you know, the full-blown programming capabilities that we have now, for us, Python sort of ex extends beyond all, extends to that platform. So, you know, when, the one thing I think for us, the customers like, you know, when we're having those discussions with customers about, you know, what workflow works best for them, 
you know, it's not an either or. Um, in many cases, it's a, um, for example, maybe you're deploying a certain style or type of room and maybe it's down to staffing, you know, at a specific location. And uh, so you might have different workflows for different locations, depending on your talent. Um, we have a lot of systems that actually use a combination of configuration and programming workflows. So locally in the room, you may have a configured system running, that's running Python using all the same tools. Um, but then uh, for, you know, for shared resources or for uh, access, authentication, uh, other things which allow you to maybe the user to run the system or configure the system on the fly from the glass with their finger, those are all handled by, you know, backend functions and programming. And so the one thing I can say that having an open language gives you, at least in, in you know, in, if you like Extron, if you're interested in using Extron, um, is that it brings some credibility. Because uh, there aren't, in our case, there aren't many people that don't understand what Python is or, or something that has benefited from Python because there are so many workflows for other companies, both internal and external um, for those companies that, um, that, that already are using the language. So it's, it's one less hump that you have to get over. And uh, to me, it, it helps to bring... Uh, in the complement of what's already been said by, by Patrick, it helps to bring that conversation kind of down to a very easy discussion. It's more or less about, you know, what are your goals are, and as opposed to having anxiety about the tools, so to speak. Uh, Rich, I'll kind of call on you to maybe p play the, uh, the the contrarian here on as far as, you know, we're, we may be more comfortable using the older proprietary tools, let's say, because that's what we've been doing for so long, yet somebody new may be more comfortable using the mainstream languages. Where do the two worlds meet? And if we had to be brought into a project that was done in, in another language, it's very hard, I think, to be able to be confident in saying that you're going to be, be successful. Well, I think that's actually the opportunity for um, established companies in our industry. Um, for a couple of reasons, um, and, and and Derek, I mean, he, he absolutely nailed it when he talked about the, the wisdom um, that you bring into a project. Um, I, I would say that you know yourself and myself, we've got a couple of years in this industry, and you know the running line that I always tell people: the reason why I'm so valuable on a project is I've broken everything every way possible. So <laughs> I've already figured out how to break everything, um, and 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 our job is to avoid that. And really, what we're dealing with more than anything else right now is that we have, um, we're gonna have new people coming in with, with a new way of doing it and new ideas, and those are fantastic. Um, but they might not have the practical knowledge of, it, it, it's, it's, you know, the, 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 we've always had the line of, it's not could you do it, it's should you do it. And our role uh, from an integration standpoint is to determine where the shoulds are. Um, and to bring in those great ideas, because we're gonna see more and more of it. I mean, we, we're moving from, dedicated serial protocols to APIs. And if you are not flexible enough to be able to embrace the fact that the more information you're gonna be getting is um, from an API standpoint, as opposed to a series of hex strings or serial commands or things that we've been used to for, for 20 odd plus years, um, it, that is gonna be an issue for you. And, and what will happen is you'll be circumvented at that point. You, you have to be flexible at this point. And, and I, that's where I say it's the opportunity because we can create that bridge. We can say, here's how it's been done before. Here's how we're doing it now. This is a great idea, but we may not be there yet. So in order to complete the project, meet the budgets, hit the client's demands and everything we need, let's work with this, build a framework. And, and we're becoming more, um, you know, in, in, in the technology world, you have program managers, you know, you have people who are responsible or the framework. They're not necessarily part of the day in, day out code, every single line of code, but they're responsible for the vision of getting it delivered. And I think that that's where we have an opportunity. It's something that we've been um, looking into more and more because again, like I said, getting close to 50, I, I, I'm not necessarily gonna have, you know, I've got kids and everything else, you know, I, I'm, either, I'm gonna either have to sleep less, which I don't sleep that much already, or staff up and, and make use of the opportunities out there. And I think that that's where, um, for more established companies, that's where your decision becomes. It, it becomes that collaboration. Um, and, and not only collaboration within your company, but collaboration outside of your industry. You know, 
all of the boards. Um, you know, their their uh, GitHub has fantastic forums to be able to work with. There's there's tons of stuff out there that we can already look at and say how has it been done before. And chances are somebody's at least approached it. Um, but getting back to my point. Um, you know what 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 we're going to be doing and again i i there's certain things where i i have i have these conversations with younger programmers all the time it's you know we have something that's purpose driven that can be done in one or two clicks and and we know it works <laughs> and it's reliable and they come and say i've just written this in html or python or something else and hey look at the 15,000 lines of code that it took me to send play <laughs> to, to a device like you know you know there there it's an efficiency of tasks and our responsibility is to constantly look and look for the most efficient ways to produce the project um, with the future in mind and being able to build on it and go. And so I think that's where we're, we're going to, I, I, I really think the next couple of years, I mean, we're, we're seeing all these press releases, especially from ISE. It, it, it's not if it's going to happen. It's a when now. We are, we're now moving over. We are, we're moving over to virtualized control processors. We are moving away from physical boxes that had IR, you know, emitters and relays and 232 ports to virtualized components because more and more of these devices do not require an IR input or a relay input or an RS-232 input. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of funny, but yeah, you know, the, the time is now, the time is now. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it's, it, it's a choice to be excited. You, you, can, you can either choose to be fearful of it or embrace it and take it head on. And uh, again, speaking from somebody who is one of the 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 elders, you know, with the tribal knowledge, um, it is something that we have to promote and say, you know what, this is a good time. This is a good thing. Um, let's push. And, and if you asked me a couple of years ago, I, I might have had a different opinion. But I think this <laughs> internet thing is going to kind of stick around. <laughs> so, so is it safe to say that you struck on something real important? You know that. The roles are changing and we're looking at things a lot differently and you're, you're talking about a programming manager or an architect, but yet there's a lot of talk in the industry about no programming required. It, it, it sounds to me that, that, there, there's a, uh, that those are different sides of the spectrum. I think that no programming required is a great goal. I really do. I, I think that I, the reality is I, I've heard it for 25 years. I mean, automation is always going to be part of the process. Um, but somebody still needs to get the project done. Somebody still needs to answer a question. Somebody still needs to deal with, and, and, and really, you know, programming, the, the, the rule we've always had, right, is, is that 20% uh, of our code does something, 80% of our code prevents it from breaking. And, and that's still the process. It is, we are dealing with not the perfect environment, not the lab environment, but we're dealing with the real world environment. And so um, there's always going to be a need for that. I think that in some, um, kind of mass market instances where, um, you know, we've always called it, you know, the, the configuration, uh, we've always, the, the configuration tools, we've always called them the, the Panda Express of programming, right? Um, you know, if, if you want Kung Pao chicken in Brooklyn, you know, your Kung Pao chicken is going to be the same in Brooklyn as it is in Anchorage, Alaska, right? That, that's it. It will stay the same. Now, you can't order off the menu. You can't special order. You get Kung Pao chicken. That's it. Um, with that thought in mind, you know, the no programming required is absolutely, it's going to simplify, it's going to streamline, um, it's going to give you an economy of scale, it provides better pricing for the end users, but that's an opportunity too, because you're able to bring in possibly um, uh, people who are deploying the project um, who aren't necessarily high level, uh, you know, program architects. Um, you're going to be able to bring somebody in who can basically assist configurators, you know, and still within within your realm and your company that you can work with. Um, I think there's always going to be a need, and again, I'm in residential. Um, I, th there's always going to be a need for a bespoke system, um, and everybody loves those, but but they're tough um, because you're dealing with very specific instances. A bespoke system is far different than a, th a three-bedroom townhouse, um, and so it comes back to a company identifying their market. You know, who, who are you catering to? How are you catering to it? Where do you fit within this market? And saying, you know, no programming required? Yeah, you know what, that's not necessarily our market. What makes us special? What do we bring to, to this process? And so, um, like I said, it's, it's great on marketing material. I love it when it's in press releases. Um, I think that some companies are better, are closer to it than others. Um, and at times, you know, I, I, if, if they can afford to be optimistic, you know, 
great. As my, as my son says, how's that working for you? So. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think that we've definitely struck on a, a lot of different options out there and, and Patrick, I'll, I'll kind of move on to you. You know, how do you choose between them? You know, you have no programming required. You have these proprietary languages. You have the mainstream languages, and and even those could can be a a, a variety. Where, but how is that decision made, and and who comes into to play in making that decision? Is it is it purely the programmer? Um, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. So there's a lot to unpack there. First, uh, a manufacturer should, I think, always provide some kind of configuration tool to make their products just work for particular use cases, right? But like Rich was saying, there will always, always, always be custom. And if, as long as there's a published API, you know, once the configuration is done, how do I extend my system? How do I expand it? How do I integrate it into my automation and monitoring system and things like that? So that's where these things could play a role, um, work together. So configurators are great to make things work out of the box, but you'll always need some way to hook into that, or not always, but in custom situations, you'll need a way to hook into that to do some kind of customization. Now, choosing between uh, traditional purpose-driven language and a modern programming language, again, depends on a lot of different factors. Sometimes it depends on who the integrator is, who the end customer is, that's becoming less and less of an issue. Of course, IT is playing more of a role now. Sometimes they want to see languages that they're familiar with and that they know that they could maintain themselves and that they have a big pool of programmers for. Just uh, from my AV programmer perspective, I've got you know, 15 or 20 years worth of modules in one language and I can't port them all over overnight. Right. So depending on the size of the project and, and what kind of functionality I need in there, I may prefer to use one of the more traditional control systems until I get all of my modules migrated over to something newer. And I expect sometime in the next few years that there will be a tipping point where dealing with the limitations of a purpose driven language will be more labor intensive than writing the new modules. But for now, it's um, for a more complex system. Uh, the traditional control systems still absolutely have a place. And sometimes mixing and matching is the way to go, to use something like a Raspberry Pi and some modern, modern programming as a gateway to some kind of service like Alexa or something like that. I want to offer one quick point that, that I was just thinking about that, as Patrick was saying, is that one thing we also have to remember too, though, and, and, and why I will still be a, a, a supporter of purpose-driven code at times, is that there's also this race to the bottom for the end line components. And as in a perfect example, you know, Apple makes a great product. They make a $99 product. Most of the time that it works, <laughs> but there are instances where it doesn't and there's an expectation for these devices. And part of our role um, is that's great that there's an API publish and all of these things, but there are some items that are still out of our control and that's the endpoint unit. And there are varying levels of quality and reliability. And, and, and again, residential is different from education, it's different from government, it's different, different from, from a knock, um, you know. And so where we constantly have to bridge that gap, again, is, is we, we've always used the term overlay control. Right, our job is to find all the parts that fit within properly. And yes, there will be a tipping point, but I think there's still always going to be a need for it because of expectations by the end user. Our job is to be seamless and to be taken for granted. And the only way we can be taken for granted is when we have all the tools still available at our disposal. Well, that sounds looks like a good good note to end on, and I, I appreciate that, and I think that this is a good uh, good discussion that we can continue having. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for joining me today, and uh, first off, uh, Patrick Murray from uh, Control House, how can people get in touch with you? How can uh, they learn more about what you're doing? Um, you just search for a Control House on any of the social media or in Google, Control H-A-U-S, and I'll pop up. And uh, you can also have a look at my website, learnavprogramming.com. Thanks. Uh, Derek Jonkis, I hope this is a good experience for you. Uh, how can people uh, learn more about you, Extron, and uh, reach out? 
Well, you can, uh, well, you know what the website is, extron.com, at least in North America, but uh, also around the world. And uh, you can reach me at djonkis at extron.com. Thanks. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, Rich, how can people find you and learn more about for goes of Design? Um, uh, best way to find me is in the Twitterverse at R Fragosa. You can also find me here at AV Nation uh, with my friend here, Steve Greenblatt. Uh, sometimes you'll find me on uh, Resi Week as well. Um, obviously support us here. And uh, if you want more about the company, FragosaDesign.com. Very good. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Steve Greenblatt. I've been your host. Uh, you can reach me on social media at Steve Greenblatt. Pretty simple. My company is Control Concepts, and we're at controlconcepts.net. Uh, I'd like to recommend that you go visit the Aviation website, aviation.tv, to learn more about the show and the other shows offered by the network, uh, the weekly shows of AV Week and Resi Week, uh, Definitely like to recommend the ITAV show and the Connected show. I think that those are very relevant to these conversations as well. Uh, please, while you're there, visit the underwriters. Uh, they help us to make these things happen and uh, show them some love. But uh, And if you can, please uh, leave us a review, either on the website, uh, some comment, or on iTunes. We definitely appreciate that. It would help us to spread the word and get other people knowing more about the show. So that's it for today. Uh, thanks for being with us today. This has been A State of Control.